Hello, I'm Lindsey Whitley, the Associate Superintendent for Communications and Community Engagement with Cumberland County Schools. Thank you so much for joining us for our Throwback Thursday edition of Cumberland Family Academy. Each week, we look forward to bringing you timely information and resources to help you help your child succeed in school and in life. Now, let's jump right into tonight's session, already in progress. Ms. George, I am excited uh, to be here this evening uh, to talk, to engage with the families of Cumberland County Schools. So uh, I'm just, I'm ecstatic. You know, this is what I do uh, dealing with high schoolers every day. It is challenging, yet it is very, very rewarding. So I just want to say thank you to every parent, every student that is joining us uh, for this evening's session. So I am uh, most happy to be here with you and bring you greetings from Reed Ross Classical High School, where academics and the arts embrace excellence and we are Cougar Nation. So just want to give you a shout out on behalf of our school and our school administration, uh, Mr. Larry Parker, principal, uh, Ms. Kristen Etchison, high school assistant principal. So uh, glad to be here. So this is a little bit of our journey today that you see on the screen. So we're gonna do something a little different. I have some wonderful guests here with us uh, that we'll get a chance to uh, hear from as they will share their expertise. And I'm excited about the fact that you will get to hear from each one of them. I will start with some basic things to know with getting your students ready for all things college. And then we will move on with our panelist introductions for this evening. And then we're going to uh, engage in a different format, if you will. And so I call it myth busters. And we're going to address 10 common myths or misunderstandings about college, what people have believed to be true, but uh, may not actually be true or um, not entirely true. So we will have about, uh, we actually do have 10 myths that we will address this evening and our wonderful panelists of admissions representatives from area colleges uh, will help us uh, go through and debunk all of these myths. So again, we're excited about having them here. So uh, I wanna go ahead and get started if we advance to the next screen. The answer is 111 schools in the state. And there may be people who did not realize that uh, for North Carolina, 58 community colleges, 16 public universities and 37 private and independent colleges. So now I'm gonna need somebody to help me, uh, Miss George and company. I need to know um, who was our first responder, who was the closest to the 111? Who was, who was the first parent and or student who was closest to the 111? Patricia, can you help with that in the chat? Yeah. Um, you got a, a hundred at 606. Shalon Long came in at 606. And you have a hundred at 606. Sarah came in with that. So those two are the closest. Same time frame. You got 116. At 6.06, you got a three-way tie. <laughs> <laughs> I see it, yep. Renata came in at 6.06, you got a three-way tie. Five away, six away. I do see Clanton Moyd as well, thank you. I think closest to all of my 100s are 11 off, but my 116 is only five away. So right. I believe that Miss uh, Renarda Floyd is going to have won our brain stimulator. I just so happen to know how to reach Miss Clanton Moy. <laughs> and so um, check your inbox uh, in about an hour, Miss Clanton Moy, just for participating. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, students, and thank you, parents. So there are a lot of choices here, which is the point of this first 
uh, question, if you will. There are a lot of options in the state. And of course, I hear a lot of students talk about going out of state, I want to be out of the state. But there is so much to choose from here in North Carolina that many families did not even realize. So it is important that you uh, do some research about this uh, great state that we're living in so that you'll be able to see all of the varied options uh, for colleges and universities. And again, these are public, private and independent and community colleges. So uh, just food for thought. Thank you so much. Uh, next slide. So really I'm breaking this down into a, a checklist of things that I've used over the years in working with high school parents and it's doesn't necessarily pertain to seniors because I don't believe we have any seniors on this call, but this is for everybody else who sort of got next, if you will, for those who actually um, are up with juniors and sophomores. So these are some things that I've begun to share with seniors and juniors um, over the years. And I want you to begin to look at some of the information and definitely begin to uh, build a plan because I'm a firm believer that you plan to fail if you fail to plan. So it's really, really important. So on a student's college prep checklist, first there is, I say get a college prep notebook. It can be a 99 cent composition book. It can be a blank spiral notebook. Uh, but this is a place where you'll keep um, and begin to write notes and gather some information. If you wanna get really, really fancy, um, you can get a little one inch binder with folders so you can slip information inside of it, but definitely get a college prep notebook that contains your research information, colleges, uh, majors, comparing costs, uh, comparing admissions requirements, and you, it, it will be good for you to start that right now. So that's uh, really, really, really important. Um, one of the biggest things that you'll be putting in this college prep notebook is a list of your top three to five schools. This is where you begin. Now, will you run into more schools that get your attention? Absolutely. But I'll say begin with a realistic list of three to five schools that you want to begin to research based on what it is that the student wants to major in or what they wanna do as a career. Uh, most students don't know a whole lot about majors right now, but they do uh, have some idea about what they want to do as a career or a general or broad career field. So definitely start with a, I call this a short list. Um, it doesn't have to be exhausting, uh, but this helps you focus your list enough. Get that, that list of schools. You begin that now. If we have ninth graders on the call, begin it now. Begin doing research and start with North Carolina in mind. Please start with North Carolina in mind first. Parents, please make sure there are state schools. Um, and what, what I mean by state, I mean colleges in the state, not necessarily public. Make sure you start with schools in our state because they give you options, they give you affordability, and also they give you uh, just a little bit more proximity. Uh, although I know the students will be ready to break out of the house by 12th grade. This, you know, these closer drives give parents a lot more peace of mind. So it's something to consider. As you approach senior year, no matter what year it is, and we talk about the senior exit interview in grade 12, but parents, I would go so far as to suggest that you are taking the time to schedule a meeting with you, your child, your high school child, and their school counselor, I would say once a year, just to begin discuss where, to discuss where the student is, what are the counselor's recommendations, perhaps uh, of some things that they could be doing. And again, you wanna do this, I would say do this earlier. You don't wanna just do this when it's registration time because then the counselor is overwhelmed because they're having to register all of the students on their caseload. So when you get in early and begin to have these conversations, when it's not so hectic in the school counseling department. So those are certain things you want to do. And again, set a date set a, to do this every year, to have this conversation, to review the student's transcript. All of these things are of vital importance, not just for the students, but of vital importance to the, to the parents. You want to know where they stand. That brings me to the next point. 
know your stats. It's addressed to students, but that GPA weighted and unweighted, that class rank, the number of courses they're taking, the rigor of the courses that they're taking, all of these things can be found out on the child's academic transcript, which is like what I call the report card on steroids. It's the official academic record where the student's academic record is, is sort of uh, engraved in stone, if you will. It's permanent. It is the record that colleges, universities, employers, and military personnel will see as they make an assessment of your child as they graduate from high school. So you want to know what is on the transcript and by all means set whatever meetings are necessary for you and your family uh, to know as much as you wanna know about what's happening on your child's transcript. Uh, then beginning in grade nine, ninth graders normally love to hear this. Um, you know, colleges don't really have a big, big concern about what happened before grade nine. They're looking at the academic record in grades nine through 12. That is what they see. A lot of my rising ninth graders gave a sigh of relief because some of them are still trying to really, really get their acts together academically, behaviorally, those kinds of things. So starting in grade nine is a great time for any student to rewrite their personal story, their academic story, their achievement story, uh, their service history. And the academic resume affords um, a place and a space for that student to begin to record all of these wonderful happenings. It, it looks much like a professional resume, um, if you will. I will leave my contact information at the end of this presentation. And for those of you who are interested in seeing a sample, I will gladly send you a sample if you reach out to me you know, using the contact information that you'll see on the final slide. So I can send you templates for this. So academic resumes begin in grade nine. And it's important that you build it as you go. It gets harder when a senior is trying to reach back to memories of ninth grade. What did I do? How many times did I make the honor roll? How many clubs and organizations uh, was I in that year? How many sports did I play that year? And then they call the counselor who really doesn't keep a record of this stuff for students. It is what you need to keep track of for your child. Get a scrapbook, uh, get a folder, if you will, and make sure you save these certificates, not because you want to put them up all over the house and embarrass the student, but because you want to be able to refer back to this documentation so that you can put achievement by achievement or achievement after achievement on the student's academic resume. So clubs and organizations, community service opportunities, student leadership uh, opportunities, all of these will go on the student's academic transcript and it needs to be built now. So you're saying, well, my, my kid's not in ninth grade. They're in 10th or 11th grade. It's not too late but you want to get in and start drafting it so that it is ready. Why is it needed? 12th grade is the year where seniors are asking teachers, counselors especially, would you please write a letter of recommendation for me? I need this recommendation uh, for college admissions. I need this recommendation for a scholarship application. And what they should be ready to give to the potential recommender is a copy of the academic resume. It makes it so much easier uh, for that person to write a better letter on your student's behalf. And actually, it's a non-negotiable in our school. If I'm going to write a letter, students at the Ross already know, where's your resume? I don't even start the draft until you have given me your academic resume. So these are important things to be remembering as uh, you go through your child's college prep checklist. Uh, next slide, please. So you want to, while we're speaking of letters of recommendation, identify the teachers or staff members or even community persons who can write letters of recommendation for you. Then as a courtesy, always give them a minimum of two weeks out of respect to their schedules to prepare this document. Sometimes you wanna give three or four weeks if you really want something uh, good and meaningful. Let me go back to the first statements of this bullet. Identify the teachers, again, or community persons who can write letters. Now, 
I phrased that intentionally. I did not say identify the teachers or community persons who would or will write letters. I specifically use the word can because your recommenders have to have the ability to write a letter, to write an effective, compelling letter, okay? Uh, so that's really, really important. You know, unfortunately, it may not be that all counselors know how to do this as effectively as they need to. So there's some things you're really, really going to need to know uh, about that. Now, we have resources. Some of us, we buy books that says letter writings and the all of those things, how to write the effective letters that we might be able to give a fair shake. But just because it was a teacher that the student liked does not mean that that teacher is able to put together a well-written, compelling letter. It is important because the scholarship organizations, admissions professionals, they have very little tolerance for poorly written products. And I probably would be getting an amen uh, from our admissions representatives in the meeting. They have very little patience for poorly written products. So please, uh, parents and students, uh, identify folks who you know will be able to do that and to do it justice, okay? Um, as we go through North Carolina, we have a place where we, uh, a portal where we can find all of those 111 colleges we talked about. And that portal is uh, through the College Foundation of North Carolina. We call that CFNC, and that will be at uh, cfnc.org. This is where students can get in right now and get their accounts set up so that they're ready to do all of the necessary work for college preparation. So that CFNC account is most important. If you haven't heard about it yet, you, you've, you've heard about it tonight. You're hearing about it tonight. Create a CFNC account, okay? High school students, you will connect it to your high school, and that means uh, your counselors or, or those professionals that can access the school's account will see every student in the school that has a CFNC account. I can see every student user at Reed Ross Classical School that has created an account if they linked it to, to Reed Ross Classical. So it is important that you set this account up now, parents, and use a non-CCS email students. You will need to use a personal email address. And while I'm speaking of personal email addresses, please make sure it is a professional sounding email address for student use, all right? It is important. I could give you examples, but we're recording and I don't want the examples that I say to be in the recording, but you know what I'm talking about when you've seen an email address that makes you go, hmm. So it's important that students are getting professional email addresses, um, last name, dot first name, and a year of birth or something like that, that is as professional as possible when you're creating these accounts, because you will be able to use these accounts after high school graduation. And a month or so after they graduate from high school, Cumberland County is going to delete their entire email account. So they don't want pertinent information sitting in their CCS email account. That is important. Uh, create an account with CFNC dot org. All right. Start drafting a personal statement essay. I can tell you more about this essay. This essay uh, can be used for multiple things uh, to include scholarships. And if you put the right information in one essay, you can use bits and pieces of it to satisfy so many different essay needs. And the student can begin to draft that now. What we know about college is that it costs and it is not cheap for the most part. So you wanna get on the scholarship hunt as quickly as possible. There are so many other scholarship match sites. I just listed one, this is a personal favorite for me. So I just pitch it out to my students. It is really comprehensive. It is like a one-stop shop. And I mean, tens of thousands of scholarships are there. So I just started with an example at unigo.com. This is a match site. Uh, the student can start right now setting up a scholarship profile and they will begin to match the student to scholarships according to what they put in their scholarship profile account. Now, this starts in grade nine. 
you will go in there and find out that there are great, there are scholarships, excuse me, that students in grades nine, 10 and 11 qualify for already. So they don't have to wait to senior year to, to be eligible for a lot of scholarships. So definitely start now with the scholarship hunt. Literally, um, quite a few of them just require that you write uh, creative essays. They're judged on the base, basis of writing essays. Some of the scholarships are, are actually called no essay scholarships. So please go through sites such as this and begin to see what's there for your students to apply for as early as ninth grade. They can apply and win in the ninth grade. Um, so you did hear that correctly. So definitely when it comes to being on the money hunt, you got to have a little bit of hustle in you because if you're going to get the money, you got to be hungry for it and set a plan to, to get uh, to maximize the amount of um, what we call uh, merit-based or uh, non-loan money. So anything that you don't have to pay back is good stuff. So loans mean you have to pay them back. But if it's a grant, if it's a fellowship, if you will, if it's a scholarship, those normally don't require any kind of payback. So just that's my blurb about scholarships for you. Next slide. So as you're doing this, again, you want to have a plan. There are so many scholarships out there. And there are students across the country who are graduating high school with one to two million dollars in scholarship offers. How in the world did they uh, get those kinds of amounts? They set quotas two or three years before graduation and they literally filled out applications that they were eligible for and they kept doing it. And they took a weekend and did three to five every weekend. By the time they finished, they had done two, 250 scholarship applications. So by the time you do that, you have bettered your chances of receiving this money, much of which goes back unclaimed every year. And I mean billions of dollars of money just goes back because the students don't have time. They don't want to write the essays. They don't want to do the work. So, so much of the money goes unclaimed. The free money is out there. You set a plan as early as possible, and then you begin to better your chances. Those one and $2 million scholars set quotas weekly. And by the time it was all said and done, they had done well over 200 scholarship applications. So it's no wonder they were able to get so much money off, uh, so many money offers, and even uh, find out that they were awarded scholarship after scholarship. Now that doesn't happen after you've done five. I'm being honest, it doesn't really happen after you've done 10 or 15. You really have to put in the work for scholarships if you wanna maximize it. And of course, at the end of all things is a solid academic record. The solid academic record goes without saying. It is what colleges really are looking for. It is what they're looking for, absolutely. They need to see that students can survive the academic loads of the college environment. So parents, those grades, when you're a student, your child is college bound. You have to play investigator, detective, uh, whatever is necessary to make sure that you are monitoring grades. You're monitoring grades at the end of the semester, yes, some students can have a, you know, a bad quarter, but thankfully quarter grades do not show up on the college transcript. Only the final grade at the end, what we call the F1 average, only that grade shows up on the high school transcript. So uh, just keep that in mind as you're monitoring student grades. That is of utmost importance, okay? Next slide. Parents, these are some things that you can do and I've gotten a sun glare in my eyes. Give me just a second. My apologies for that. These are things that you can do. My parent checklist is short, but it needs to be followed nonetheless. Check on your child. Do not assume that they're taking care of or that they are taking care of business every minute of the day every day of the week, okay? And I put down threatening at your own discretion. You know what works for your house. 
completely. But please make sure that students do not let go of the reins when it comes to being prepared for college. You must monitor. They must be monitored. I know you want to give them independence. But when it comes to looking at their academics and their grades, this process must be monitored with great deliberation. It is important. Set dead deadlines for them, okay, to keep them motivated. Leverage whatever you need to leverage. I need this. We're looking at maybe trying to get you a car, but this is what I'm going to need to see in your grades. So begin to talk about that. Yeah, you talked about a job, but before the job comes, this is what I'm going to need to see before the job, and these are the kind of grades I'm going to need to see while you hold a job, so you, I will let you keep it. So those are things you really, really want to be really intentional about, okay? And as you prepare uh, for this college prep year, going out of junior year into senior year, have a plan for paying for college application fees. Um, every student may not qualify for free reduced lunch, which means sometimes they're going to, you know, parents, you'll bear the full burden of application fees. Some are 35, some are $45, some are $85. And when you're talking about trying to do seven, eight or nine college applications, for your child to you know, keep their options open, you definitely wanna have a plan for making sure these things can get paid for. It will not be processed normally without that payment, right? North Carolina schools um, have a great opportunity to participate in uh, college application week, which is great. It was two weeks this year and there are a host of schools, many on this call even, that participate and will allow for that span of time for students to complete and submit applications for free. So you wanna be paying attention. This is only for seniors, uh, mind you. But for senior year, you wanna be looking out for the fall for whenever college application week is. That is the time to really, really get it done uh, where, when colleges are agreeing to waive the application fees. Any college related events in the community and at your child's school, please attend. And you will need access when it comes to things uh, having to do with financial aid. FAFSA, you will hear a lot about. The free application for federal student aid. You're gonna need tax information, parents. You're gonna need it ready. One of the biggest woes of senior year um, for students is that their parents sort of drag their feet with getting the tax information needed for them to complete the FAFSA and other things. So please, uh, please help your child by making sure you're on top of this information and have it ready when they need it, okay? That is really, really important. That is our student and our parent checklist. Um, hopefully I've given enough information. That's a lot, but we are recording. And again, I'll be glad to follow up with anyone. Uh, that is our parent checklist. If you have any questions for later, we will get to them at the end of the session. All right, so we're going to shift gears a little bit. And we're going to start our, our panel discussion entitled Myth Busters, but we want to meet these wonderful people who are here with us. And so let's go ahead and, and, and roll the, the slide. So grateful to have Mr. Michael Head, Senior Associate Director of Admissions at Fayetteville State University with us. Thank you, Mr. Head. Advanced. Hello, 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 thank you. We have Mr. Jamie Legg, who is the Dean of Admissions uh, of Methodist University. So glad to have you with us, Mr. Legg. You wanna give a, uh, a greeting? Hello, everyone. All right, so glad to have you. Next, we have Mrs. Angela Sykes, who is the admissions recruiter at Fayetteville Technical Community College. Welcome, Mrs. Sykes. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for having us here tonight. We then have Ms. Kristen Woodell, who's the Associate Director of Undergraduate Admissions at UNC Pembroke. Ms. Woodell, thank you for being with us. Hi, thank you all for having us tonight. And last but certainly not least, we have Mr. Stone Yeats, who is an admissions counselor at UNC Greensboro. Welcome, Mr. Yeats. Awesome, thanks for having me and thank you to everybody for joining us tonight. So we're gonna to begin to roll uh, with our myth busters and we're going to address 10 myths tonight. And each of these panelists have been assigned some myths that they're going to address. I will be reading the myth, then after the myth is read, uh, that admissions 
um, professional will begin to talk about why this uh, probably is indeed a myth and they're going to help us debunk it. And so please be listening because some of these may have been your uh, misconceptions about the college experience. So we are going to get started with that. Let's go. Myth number one says, it's better to get good grades than take challenging courses as it relates to getting into college. Mr. Head. Uh, well, it, it's always great to get good grades, but it's even better to get good grades as you continue to move forward and challenge yourself. Uh, because when you are seeking that uh, dream school of yours, they are looking to see, especially if you're uh, pursuing a selective institution, right? You have selective, you have semi-selective, and then you have rolling admissions institutions. So depending on the institution that you are seeking uh, to be admitted to, they may be looking for students who have continuously challenged themselves in the classroom from day one. Um, I tell people all the time, it's easy uh, to get an A in an easy class, right? But how do you perform in those challenging classes? How do you perform around individuals who are just as intelligent uh, as you are? You know, how do you fare against those individuals? And, it, you know, that's the kind of thing that determines scholarship opportunities. So it, it determines admittance into the institutions of your choice, scholarship opportunities, but at the base of it all, it enhances your individual uh, academic uh, base. And so that's what it's about. So, you know, as an institution, we are all looking for students who have continuously challenged themselves in the classroom uh, to go above and beyond to separate themselves from other students uh, in their senior class. Thank you so much, Mr. Head. I have time for a 30 second ad. Is there anybody in our panelists? All right, we're gonna move on to myth number two. I need to decide on my career before I can choose a college. Ms. Waddell, what do you have for us? So it is important to have an idea of what you want to do with your life. Um, I know when I was coming out of high school, I had that, the idea that I wanted to become a pediatric cardiologist. So I knew that in order to get there, I had to start somewhere. So you have to have a game plan. So know about what you want to do. I know you heard that I said a pediatric cardiologist, and I'm not doing anything near that, but that's okay. We'll talk about that a little later. But you have the opportunity opportunity to select colleges that will help you hit your plan A, plan B, and plan C. Always have those backups. That's important. So you're not feeling as if you fail if you decide to change your mind. You can come into college undecided, but it's easier if you have some type of idea of what you want to do and make sure that school has what you want to do so they can at least help you get where you need to go. I chose to come to Pembroke because I could get a biology degree. So that was something that I looked at when I was deciding exactly which school I wanted to attend. And you need to make sure that you're doing that as well. So students, if you have an idea of what you want to do, make sure that whatever college you're attending has something that can help you get there. It's all about where you want to go and having the plan to get exactly where it is. Thank you so much, Ms. Waddell. Is there a 30 second ad? All right, so we're on to myth number three. You can't get into a good college if you did poorly in ninth or 10th grade. Mr. Yeats. Yeah, I'm gonna have to say that one is definitely a myth, especially for, I would don't wanna speak for everyone here, but I would say a lot of our institutions would agree with that. My best advice is to always, as Mr. Head said, try to do your best, try to take those rigorous, challenging courses, really push yourself and step outside of your comfort zone and, and try to go a step above and a step beyond academically. But we also know mistakes happen. You know, We know that not every class is gonna be every student's strong suit. You, you're not gonna be the best at every single subject and that is okay. Uh, essentially what we're looking for is academic growth. Now you can struggle a little bit your ninth grade year, uh, but what we wanna see you do after that is recognize that you're struggling, seek help, 
Seek out uh, the advice of your high school counselor. Seek out resources and tools that you can use to be more successful in an academic setting. Uh, ultimately, all of us, I would say, are really just making sure when we're reviewing applications, we want to make sure that students are prepared to be successful when they come to our respective universities. We don't want to put you in a position where you're not going to be successful when you get here. We want to set you up for success. We don't want to set you up for failure. And the best way to demonstrate that, uh, if you do struggle a little bit your ninth or 10th grade year, definitely uh, work hard to improve on that. Uh, we all know a GPA is really easy to bring down. It's really hard to bring up, and we take that into consideration as well. And, you know, most universities, colleges uh, will give you the opportunity to supply an essay, and that's an opportunity for you to talk about any hardships or extenuating circumstances that may have negatively impacted your academic performance in a way that you don't feel like your transcripts accurately reflect your true academic ability. So we only know as much about you as you put on your application. So definitely explain everything. Thank you so much, Mr. Yeats. Is there a 30 second in? Um, just really quick, you know, it's, uh, it's as they always say, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Um, in addition to that, you know, most of the, the institutions, we are looking to see um, what your trajectory is, what your academic trajectory is. You know, are you, have you consistently increased your profile, you know, from day one? And so you can certainly recover uh, from not performing to, to the top level in your ninth or 10th grade year. Good stuff. Thank you so much. Myth number four. Here we go. Here we go. The best time to visit colleges is after you have been admitted. Mr. Legg. Mac, I told you earlier, you gave me the, the two easiest ones. I'm sure my fellow panelists are uh, jealous that I get this one. But yeah, that, that's exactly just the opposite in my mind. Uh, to me, the best time to visit colleges um, is well before you've, you've been admitted and, and quite honestly, well before you even apply. Um, in my mind, students should start visiting colleges, um, you know, on an informal basis as early as, as when they're, you know, first in high school and, and maybe even before. Um, when you're on vacation, if you're heading to the beach, you know, stop by a campus. If you're going to the mountains, um, drive through a campus. Um, with the best time to officially visit campuses, in my mind, is, uh, you know, sometime during the uh, junior year uh, as you're starting to get serious about schools and use those visits uh, that you do during the junior year, maybe even the summer and, and even early in the senior year, use those visits to help determine which schools you're actually going to apply to. Um, you know, not, not wait until after you've been admitted because at that point in time uh, with some schools, um, you may not find out until you're admitted until January, February, March of your senior year, and you're going to have to turn around and make a decision about whether or not that school is the right fit for you by May, um, and that's just too late. So to me, um, you need to start that process well before you even start the application process. Good stuff. Thank you, Mr. Legg. Is there a 30-second ad? Yeah, I'll hop in really quick and I'll say, you know, it's just like shopping online, right? Uh, all of our websites are going to look great online, but, you know, the best way to find the best fit is to actually go in person and, and try the campus on for size and make sure it really is, uh, is where you want to spend the next four plus years of your life. And I want to add really quickly is that, you know, when you're applying to colleges, it costs money. And so if you visit schools and realize, hey, I'm not even interested in this school anymore, it saves you that application fee on the front end. Good stuff. Thank you so much. Uh, really, really good information coming out here. Um, on to myth number five, I will automatically be successful in college if I just focus on my grades. What you got for us, Mr. Head? Um, absolutely false. Um, you know, a good part of your college experience and, and, and how you succeed in college is how you transition uh, mentally. Um, how you transition socially. And so it's beyond the classroom. Certainly the classroom is, is a, a, a good, a, a big part of it, uh, but it's multifaceted. Um, you need to know, you know, where your resources are. Uh, when you need help, who do you turn to? Uh, you know, what kind of people you need to hang around? 
uh, be around ambitious people, join organizations, start your networking, um, all of those things uh, equal success in college beyond the classroom. And so it's, it's definitely uh, important that you, you know, mentally, socially, and academically uh, engage in your college experience to make it a total experience. Good stuff. Thank you, sir. Is there a 30 second ad? Sure. Um, I tell students every single day, get involved on whatever campus it is that you attend. Regardless what school you choose to attend, get involved, make those connections and build your support system there. Your parents aren't going to be there every single day while you're in class or on campus. It's those people that you're in class with, that you're joining those organizations with, that your advisors, make sure you're building those connections and that will help you be more successful in college. Thank you so much. All right, on to myth number six. Community college is only for students, I like this one, who are not good enough for a four-year school. Miss Sykes, what do you have? This is absolutely not true. It's one of the biggest myths that we face. So the community college is actually the best kept secret. We, may, we have many students that come to us that have GPAs of 3.0 or higher. Community colleges have an open door policy. This means students must have a high school diploma or GED to attend. There are no hard admissions deadlines and the community college is designed for students that want to get into the workplace quickly. They can receive a certificate and a trade skill in just a year or they can complete their first two years and then transfer to a four year school to, to finish their degree major. Beginning at the community college offers many advantages. It's for the student that wants to save money. The first two years cost a fraction of what a four-year school will cost. One year to community college is about 2,500 versus a four-year school. If a four-year school runs between 10 to $50,000 a year, that's a savings of 20 to 100,000 in just two years. Oh, and the community colleges have no application fees. So cost is a really big factor of whether or not a student would want to attend a community college. It's also for the student that doesn't want to test. Community colleges re don't require any kind of admissions test, and that means no ACT or SAT scores. It's also for the student that wants a smaller class size, which allows for one more one-on-one -on -one attention. Because classes are about 25 students or less, they get that attention. It's for the student that wants flexibility in their classes. A lot of students are working while they're going to school. In the community college, they can schedule their classes around their work schedule because these schools offer day and nighttime classes. You may also like to know that community colleges provide the same quality education as the four-year schools. So just to clarify, community college really is for everyone. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, is there a 30 second ad? She set us all straight. Thank you, Ms. Sykes. All right. So on to myth number seven. You must decide on a career or a major before you select a college. Just have another stab at it. This is definitely false. Um, a lot of students actually enter college as undecided majors because they may have an idea of what they want to do, but they don't know exactly how they want to get there, or they may be interested in two polar opposite things. The wonderful thing about universities today is you will have to take general education courses, which will allow you to kind of get a feel of many different things and usually in college anyway, if you come in with a major already declared, you're likely to change it. I changed my major three times while I was at Pembroke. And like I told you earlier, I started off with a biology degree, ended up with exercise sports science. So at university levels, you have those opportunities to really pick and choose what you want to do and find what you're passionate about. Because of those general education courses, it's gonna give you a well-rounded liberal arts education. Great stuff, Ms. Waddell, thank you. Is there a 30 second ad? All right, moving on to myth number eight, almost to the end of our list. 
planning for college starts during the junior year of high school. Yeah, once again, Mr. Mack, you've, you've thrown me a, a complete softball. Um, planning for college really starts, in my mind, uh, ideally before a student even enters high school, but, but certainly um, early in the, in the high school years. Uh, the course selection, uh, as we discussed earlier with the rigor of the courses and, uh, and that type of thing is, is incredibly important. Um, you know, in, in North Carolina public schools, uh, we're blessed that the um, default curriculum is college preparatory, uh, but that doesn't mean that every uh, college preparatory curriculum is appropriate for every school that students may be considering. Uh, so to me, that, that uh, planning really can start as early as middle school in my mind. Uh, I know that uh, my kids both took uh, some high school courses uh, during their middle school years. Um, and were able to, to move into higher level courses uh, when they got into high school. Um, I have a daughter who's a senior right now, and we started planning pretty early in the process. Uh, she ended up with, I think, four or five AP courses and a total of six dual enrollment courses. And you're not able to do those things uh, without early planning and, uh, and, and getting that process rolling uh, early in the, in the uh, process. So, yeah, that, that myth is uh, completely busted. Thank you, Mr. Legg. Is there a 30 second ad? Um, you know, some people literally uh, start planning as early as pre-birth of their child. You know, mm -hmm. they're already planning for the financial side of things from day one, you know, developing those uh, college plans. Uh, in addition to, you know, as early as elementary school, exposing them to college campuses uh, and different activities on those campuses just so that they can be part of that environment. And so it starts as early as you want for it to start, uh, to be candid. Thank you so much, sir. Two very great perspectives, one on the student end and one on the parent end of the planning uh, for college. So uh, thank you again, really appreciate that. Myth number nine, you will have a better chance of getting into professional or graduate school if you go to a university that offers these graduate programs. What do you say, Mr. Yeats? Well, I know there's a couple different perspectives out there, but in my personal opinion, I'm gonna say this one is also a myth, all right? Um, the thing that I want you to know is that the specific program you might be interested in may not even be offered at the undergraduate level. There are tons of universities that have great programs that are recognized, you know, regionally or nationally at the undergraduate level, but don't offer a graduate level program. There are other institutions that have phenomenal graduate level programs, uh, but maybe their undergraduate program isn't as well recognized as some other institutions. You do not have to, uh, if there's a specific uh, graduate program you're interested in at a particular institution, you do not necessarily have to attend that institution for your undergraduate degree. Now, I will say there are a lot of institutions that are looking to diversify their graduate school and the students within their graduate school. And oftentimes they particularly look at students from other institutions because they have a different background and they have different academic experiences. And that can help diversify the academic experience of their graduate program and help broaden the perspectives of students in those programs. So. I would say it's absolutely important to have a plan if you know you're gonna do a postgraduate program. Uh, not every school has a medical school, not every school has a dental school, not every school has a pharmacy school, right? And it's okay to be thinking about those programs now and I highly recommend thinking about them early, but don't limit yourself to one institution just because you're really passionate about one of their graduate programs or postgraduate programs. You know, Definitely check out all of your options and it's absolutely okay to mix and match two different institutions. Good stuff. Thank you, sir. Is there a 30 second ad? Yeah, I would like to add something there. Uh, while I, I do agree that it's a myth that you must uh, go to a, the school that is uh, has the graduate program that you want, I, I would caution to say that this is all that this myth is always uh, a myth because there are certain programs, particularly in some of the health sciences programs, where it's actually advantageous to do your undergraduate degree on the campus. And I'll use Methodist as an example. We've got three programs in the health sciences uh, that are graduate level programs, our physician assistant program, 
our Doctor of Physical Therapy program and our Doctor of Occupational Therapy program. All three of those programs actually give preferential consideration to students who do their undergraduate coursework on our campus. And that's not uncommon, uh, particularly in the health sciences field. So, um, you know, I would, I would certainly encourage you to reach out to the graduate programs and, and ask them directly if, if they give preferential consideration, uh, because that is very common, especially in the uh, health sciences arena. Good stuff. Thank you for the, the vital uh, perspective there, uh, Mr. Lay. Appreciate it. it. Brings us to our final myth of the uh, evening, folks. College is only for the smartest students. I kind of love this myth. What do they mean by smart? Is it an IQ? Is it that they get straight A's? Maybe they just apply themselves more and study more than others. I've met people with doctorate degrees that don't have any common sense, which makes them seem not so smart. And I've met people that only have high school diplomas that are some of the smartest people that I know. Everyone is smart about something. Maybe it's that you can read music or you never got a math problem wrong. Maybe you can rebuild your carburetor. My point is everyone is smart about something. If you want to learn about something different, or you want to learn more about what you're already good at, that is what college is for. It's not just for smart people. You're taught what you need to know. Sure, some of us may have to study harder than others, but it doesn't mean that college is only for the students that have 3.0s and above. You'll find that some subjects will come easier to you than others, but we all struggle with something in school at some point. It doesn't mean that you're not smart. It just means you might have to study a little harder and a little more often. Most jobs require their employers to have some, I'm sorry, most jobs require their employees to have some level of college education. And it really doesn't matter where you go to school, but it is important that you go to school. Just make sure that it's the school that's the right fit for you. Great, great, great stuff, great perspective. I love it. Everybody has their own level of smarts. Is there a 30 second ad to this one? Right. Well, I will say this, college is for the smartest students, right? You gotta have enough sense <laughs> to know that college is important. So it takes a certain level of smarts to kind of get it, you know? So I'll, maybe I'll come from that angle. <laughs> You're so right, Mr. Head, because I wanted to say that. Um, so I'm glad you did. <laughs> Only smart people do go to school because they're smart enough to go to school. How important it is. <laughs> it is important. Great stuff. Love, love the tag team. What I will do, because we do have some, um, some time remaining, I do want to give... Um, just your, and it can be as broad or as specific as it needs to be. I'll call our panelists by name. I just want you to give your best final thought to this, these families and students as they are in the planning process, what you think might, might be your most crucial point. And then after that, we'll segue into our uh, question period. Mr. Head, I wanna start with you. Your, your, your last best piece of advice as they, uh, continue the search? Um, <clears throat> you know, reach out to the schools that your students are interested in attending. Uh, connect with their admissions officers as early as possible to see what they are looking for in their students for admissions. And uh, get that information and, and march towards that those goals. You know, lately, uh, in the last couple of weeks, uh, really, throughout my career here at Federal State, I always run into individuals who want to graduate from high school early. And as a result, they end up missing courses that they need to get into the college of their choice. So yes, you do graduate early, but then you're missing certain courses that you need to get into the college of your choice. So touch base with those colleges you're interested in as early as possible to see what they're looking for in their potential students. Great stuff, thank you, sir. Miss Waddell, uh, find another wisdom. I would say find your fit. Get, get onto the campuses that you're thinking about. Make sure that 
that campus feels like home to you. I, every school is not for everybody and you may have this one particular school in mind and then you walk on campus and you don't feel it. So you'll understand the feeling as soon as you get on campus when you know that you're where you're supposed to be. So make sure you're visiting campuses early, tour campuses and don't be afraid to ask questions. Make sure you're building connections and even ask people outside of the admissions office just how their experience have, has been at those schools. Great stuff. Thank you so much. Uh, final thoughts, nugget of wisdom, Mr. Legg. Yeah, I think, um, you know, for me, the, the thing would be to try to make the process as enjoyable and stress-free as possible. Um, I'm not sure I did a great job of that as a dad, to be perfectly honest with my daughter, but she has decided what school she's uh, attending. Um, and uh, and we're, we're all very pleased with that decision. But also know that you can't make a wrong decision. If you, as Kristen said, if you find the place that's the right fit for you, then you've done something right. And then when you get on that campus, take advantage of all of those opportunities that that campus offers and take advantage of the reasons that that place was the right fit for you. If you do those things, you can't go wrong with the decision. Thank you, sir. Very, very good. Miss Seitz, uh, parting wisdom. Well, my parting wisdom is don't ever think you can't go to college because of money, because of the cost. There is a college out there that is going to meet your need. Every single college has their own scholarships to take advantage of. And there are so many grants out there. There's federal grants, there's state grants. There are so many scholarships that you can find on things like fastweb.com. You just have to answer those questions that they're asking you honestly, and then they're going to tell you what scholarships you should apply for. Don't ever let the fear of not having enough money keep you from going to school because there is a college out there that you can go to. You just have to find the right fit and fill out that FAFSA form and get all the help that you can get. Price should never be a reason why you feel you can't go to school. That's it for me. Good stuff. Thank you so much for that share. And Mr. Mr. Yeats, what do you have? Well, it's a little tough going last because all the great answers have already been taken. So I'm just going to reiterate a little bit of some things that have already been mentioned. Uh, Mr. Head brought this up. I think it's very important that you are aware of what the uh, minimum course requirements are for you to be admitted to a specific university. I see it all the time where a student is missing that second foreign language or they're missing their fourth math. Those tend to be the two biggest offenders. Um, and I, I know that at least some of the schools in the UNC system can, can attest to that. Um, so absolutely be aware of those. And, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help. There, you may be the first in your family to go to college. And you may have not a clue what you are doing, but know that all of us here tonight are here to help you. We really want the best for you. Uh, you know, as it was mentioned before, there's no one size fits all school. And you really just need to reach out to uh, everybody, get as much information as possible, start as early as possible and give yourself the luxury of time. What an excellent way to wrap us up, Mr. Yates. You did swimmingly, sir, swimmingly. Uh, great stuff. Thank you, guys. Uh, my panelists, thank you so much. You guys, your expertise, your knowledge, your calm has been invaluable to us this evening. So I do want to give a very, very personal note, note of thanks uh, to each of you. Wow, that was a great session. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our Throwback Thursday Cumberland Family Academy session. Each week, we look forward to bringing you information and resources. So if you enjoyed watching tonight's session, be sure to visit our website at www.familyacademy.ccs.k12.nc.us. There, you will find additional sessions and information and even resources to help you help your child in school and in life. Thank you again for joining us.